morning. It's great to see you. Happy New Year. I can't think of a better way than to start the new year than gathering together in the house of the Lord, being with uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ, getting into God's Word, singing, singing some songs to Jesus, and, uh, and just really setting our course for this next year. Uh, putting the crosshairs, if you will, on the cross, on Jesus, saying, this is, this is what I'm about, this is where I'm going. Christianity is all about new beginnings. 2 Corinthians chapter 5.17 says it this way, If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So I know there's some here that have been, uh, well, let me just do this. Uh, how many of you have walked with the Lord for five years or less? Anybody? All right, praise God. Glad you're here. Amen. How many have, have walked with the Lord 50 years? I know I took a big jump there. Look at that. 50 years. The Bible says you are a new creation. 60 years. You know, we could keep going. Hands would, hands would keep going up. My point is that uh, no matter how long you have been a Christian, 80 years, the Bible says you are a new creation. Isn't that a wonderful word, new? We love new in our culture, don't we? And this is all through the power of God. This is all forgiveness. You wake up as a new creation because you're forgiven of your sin. And so we have, we have this, this constant new life. We are, we, are, we are in Christ. Every single day can be a new year type of day. There's a certain thing that happens when that calendar flips from one year to the next we think okay well this is going to be the year that i am going to fill in the blank right lose weight uh become more organized start you know just whatever you know save up money i mean we all have been through this <laughs> right more than once but as a christian every day can be that type of a that type of a day that type of a of a, of a new year because technically there's no difference between new year's day than any other day it's 24 hours the, the earth revolves around the sun. This is how our days are marked, isn't it? But holidays certainly are significant. Culturally, holidays are significant. Even biblically, holidays are significant. So I thought with the arrival of a new year, I thought that it would be fun and interesting and encouraging and edifying to take a look at the New Year's days that we see in the Bible. Have you ever done this? There are New Year's days recorded in God's word for us. So a, a little, a little uh, um, introductory material here. The Israelite calendar uh, was composed of 12 months, just like our calendar. Uh, most calendars are tied to a lunar cycle, each month lasting 29 or 30 days. But you know, we can't get it right, right? Because we have to have a leap year, right? We have to throw an extra day in there so, so that it lines everything up. And they had to do similar uh, similar adjustments in their calendar. In, in Israel, the first month of the Hebrew calendar is a month called Abib. Everybody say Abib. Good job. Uh, however, when they went into captivity in Babylon because they forsook the Lord, they sinned, they fell into idolatry, they worshiped things that were not God, they thought they were better than God. Sound familiar? And, uh, and so, so uh, the Babylonians, their enemies, came in and took them captive into Babylon. Babylonia, Babylon, and, uh, and then the, the first day or the first month of the Babylonian calendar, they adopted the same name as Nisan. How many of you drive Nisans? No, that's okay. <coughs> but when you read, excuse me, when you read Nisan in the Bible, it's not talking about cars, it's talking about the first month of their calendar. So Abib and Nisan are basically, <coughs> excuse me, first month. Now here's what's interesting. Hope you find this interesting. This phrase, the first day of the first month, that's what we would say New Year's Day, right? First day, first month. Uh, this phrase occurs in the Bible. Anybody guess how many times? Eight times. Eight times. Now, here's why that's significant. Let's just talk for a moment about uh, numbers in the Bible. The study of numbers and their significance is called numerology. Uh, certain numbers in the Bible clearly have important meanings. Any acute Bible student, any Bible reader would take a look at numbers like 7, for example. Number 12, for example. Uh, 40, these are all biblically significant numbers. Uh, Israelites wandered in the desert for how many years? 40 years. Jesus was tempted how many days? 
40 days in the desert. These are, these are significant. Uh, how many tribes of Israel? 12 tribes of Israel. How many apostles did Jesus have? 12 apostles. So, so there's something going on. Um, the number seven is often, maybe many of you know this, the number seven is often uh, uh, referred to as the number of completion. Uh, in the book of Revelation, the number seven occurs 54 times. That's it. You can't read Revelation and say, well, seven doesn't mean anything. It obviously means something. Revelation is the culmination of all, right? Isn't it? It's the completion of, of God's whole plan. So it's fitting that this number seven would occur so many times in the book of Revelation. Even uh, if we go outside of the Bible, we see uh, the number of seven. How many notes in a musical scale? Do, re, mi. I'm not going to sing for you, but there's seven notes in a musical scale, and then that number eight begins anew, right? Seven days in a week. When you get to the eighth day, it starts the cycle over again. Uh, and so eight often is the number of new beginnings. So how fitting is it that this phrase, first day of the first year, or uh, yeah, first day of the first month, would be in the Bible eight times. Now, I must say that uh, many individuals, many groups have taken uh, numerology way too far. Uh, and you can buy books, and I'm sure there's websites and all of that, that they, they find these so-called hidden messages in the Bible uh, based on the numerical value of Hebrew letters and on and on and on it goes. Uh, listen, uh, this is not a secret book. Be very skeptical when people say, oh, there's a secret message in the Bible and you add up all these numbers of letters because in Hebrew, each letter has a number and, it, and people just get way too deep in this. And at the very most, it's interesting, these secret message things, hidden messages, um, but just it's, it's way too skeptical. So it's possible to put too much emphasis in that, um, but we must understand and we must, and hopefully I've made the case here today, uh, that some numbers are biblically significant. So what do we make of this phrase, the first day of the first month? Uh, this is the number of new beginnings. Um, just a, a, couple, a couple more uh, things here. Seven days, Leviticus 23.3. Uh, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It's the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And so then the eighth day begins a new week. Also, in the Bible, there's a sabbatical year. Did you know that? Exodus 23.10. Six years you shall sow your land, gather in its produce. But the seventh day you shall let the land rest fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. God loves the poor people. And what they leave the beasts of the field may eat, in like manner do with your vineyard and olive grove. Okay, eighth day. Eighth, the number eight, new beginnings. When God destroyed the world with a flood, how many people were on the ark? Eight. Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. Fascinating, right? Again, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but there is something significant about the number eight. It's fascinating. Uh, when I discovered that there were eight occurrences of this phrase in the Bible, and it's easy to do. If you have some Bible software, you can just type in in your search bar, first day, first month, and eight, actually nine entries pop up, but one of them, well, I'm not going to get into that. One of them doesn't, 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 it's not talking about the first day of the first month. Okay, so we're going to take a brief look on each of these eight. Rarely would I preach a sermon with eight points, um, because usually after three, maybe four, people just, you know, days out. But I know you're not like the first service. <laughs> and I know, even if you're up all night, that you're, gonna, you're here because you love God, you love his word. And I want you to see and just maybe take a look at your own life this morning and say, do any of these eight resonate with me? Because with each one, I'm going to share an application, a, a way to apply this to your life, a way to look at your life and say, is this something that I should think about and focus upon as we enter a new year? So don't try to memorize all eight and all of that, but just say, Lord, do you have this one for me? Is this something that, that maybe I need to, where there's a minus in my life, maybe this is a time that it becomes a plus, okay? So that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, let's pray and ask God to bless this time in his word. Father, thank you. 
Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that your word addresses so many issues, so many deep issues in our lives. Thank you that your word is living and active, able to judge our thoughts and our attitudes, able to, able to divide uh, um, these different motivations of our heart. Only you can do this, Lord, and, and we pray that, that you, would, you would help us as we look at this, Father, because we want to grow and learn and be closer to you. So have your way here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the book of Genesis, we find the first occurrence of this phrase, first day of the first month. It's in Genesis chapter 8. By the way, I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to follow along. We're going to kind of be skipping through some of the different books. uh, Mostly will be in the Old Testament. We will put verses on the screen for you. But uh, I've always found it helpful, even when the pastor mentions you know, this verse or that verse, that I'll try to find it in my Bible just because it helps me uh, to see it in my Bible. It helps me to, to grow and being able to find different places in the Bible. But here's the first occurrence. It's in Genesis chapter eight thirteen. It came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And so obviously obviously here the context is Noah and the flood. He is on the ark. And this phrase, uh, first day of the first month, is referring to Noah's 601st birthday. And as he's on the ark there, the water begins receding And so this is a time to remember God's faithfulness. And so this would be my first application for you today. Is 2023 the year that you need to put a little bit more emphasis on remembering God's faithfulness? In the midst of a difficult season, Noah and his family literally watched the world melt away, if you will. They watched their friends drown. They saw their home, their land, whatever possessions they had, that were not there on the boat with them. Uh, They watched their world go underwater. And maybe 2022 for you, you watched your world go underwater. Uh, But nonetheless, they, at the same time, they witnessed God's faithfulness because God had told Noah, I will establish a covenant with you. God told Noah that he would destroy the earth, but God also told Noah that I will save your family. I will save these animals. And God was faithful. So as you begin a new year, Remember that God is, has been, and always will be faithful to you. God will always be faithful no matter what happens. I hear forecasting of, you know, a financial doom, financial crisis coming this year. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But I do know that God will be faithful. I do know that God will be faithful. So may this year be a year that you remember his faithfulness. The second occurrence of the first day of the first month occurs in the next book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 40, Exodus chapter 40, verse 2, it says, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. So we move on from Noah, and now we're talking about Moses. And all of the people that he is leading, Exodus begins, as many of you know, with God's people in slavery, living under the rule of a tyrant, of, of, of a tyrant, Pharaoh, there. It's a beautiful story. By uh, a few chapters, however, God sets his people free, and now they are living as a free people. And here in Exodus chapter 40, uh, God tells Moses on the first day of the first month, on New Year's Day, set up a tabernacle. Set up a tabernacle. And so what is a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a place to meet with God. A tabernacle is a place to meet with God. You could call it a tent of meeting, a place of meeting. And so the application for you, for I, uh, meet with God regularly. Meet with God regularly. This is the commitment that we must make if we are to be healthy Christians. If we are to be disciples of Jesus, and we all certainly should want that. We need to meet with God regularly. The tabernacle, this is our quiet time. This is a time that we set aside uh, preferably every day, but at least a few times a week where we can get alone with 
our Bibles. We get away, we meet with God. Like the Israelites, we were slaves, but now we are free. So set up a tent of meeting in your life. Build that tabernacle. Build that daily time that you can be with God. Uh, say no to the constant rush and noise and create this space for quiet. We'll keep talking about that because number three occurs just a few verses later where in verse 17 it says it came to pass in the first month of the second year on the first day of the month that the tabernacle was raised up. So it took them some time. It took them some time to build this tabernacle and it takes some time to build a habit into your life. And maybe it's taken you a long time to set up a place of meeting in your life. Maybe you started off 2022 saying this is the year that I'm going to read the Bible and maybe you only got to Leviticus. Or maybe you got to Numbers. Uh, but it was slow going. Uh, maybe you found that you're not on the one year Bible reading plan. You're on the five year Bible reading plan. And what I want to say is that it takes some time, that that's okay. The application for you and for I is don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. We need this place of meeting, and even if we try and try and try again, uh, you just keep persevering, and you keep trying, and you commit to doing it. And this year, as, as we have decided as a church to read through the Bible, we're going to read... Uh, if all goes well, we're going to read the Old Testament and read the New Testament twice if you sign up for our Bible reading plan. Pastor Robert announced it a little earlier, uh, where if you text the word Bible to that number that they had on the screen, uh, that you would get then uh, daily reminders of the different passages that we are reading. We also, if you also have our church app, if you have our, or if you've been on our church website, there's a, a beautiful feature built into our app and our website that is going to enable us to develop community. Um, uh, and this is a messaging application built within our church website and our church app. So if you have the app and you, you go to the top right corner, you see a couple little speech bubbles there. Or if you go to our website, you see in the, the right corner it says messaging. If you click there, there's different groups that you can get in. And this is all just our church. And so we have a Bible reading group where you can join that group and we'll be posting comments and different devotionals and talking about what we're learning because we don't just want you to read the Bible, but we want to do it in community. We want to do it together as a church. So I'd encourage you to, um, to do that, to sign up. It might, uh, if you've never done that before and you, you click on that messaging or if it's on your phone, you click on that little, uh, those two speech bubbles there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, uh, it might ask you to create an account. If you have any problems at all doing that, just find somebody who's uh, 12 years old or younger, and they will help you get that all set up. They'll be able to do that really, really fast. Um, so listen, but don't give up. Uh, don't give up on yourself. Uh, remember God's faithfulness. The Lord loves you. And so you continue on. By his grace, you just keep going. Uh, how did the snail get to the ark? You've heard this before. You know, just a, a short amount at a time. I almost said one step at a time, but I don't know if snails take steps. They just kind of slime along there, right? But the snail made it. You know, the snail made it to the ark. And uh, so you just keep going little by little. Uh, sometimes you're going to lack faith, but God is faithful. Your right standing with God is not based on your performance. It's not based on how successful you are in your quiet time. Uh, your right standing with God is based on him, on his righteousness. And when you really understand that, it's just going to give so much life to you. Um, the Lord loves you. Okay, so we've looked at three so far, right? We've, we've talked about remember God's faithfulness, setting up that tabernacle, meeting with him regularly, not giving up on that. Uh, do any of those resonate with you? Maybe number four is, uh, is more for you. Number four, we find in Second Chronicles chapter 29. This is the fourth occurrence of this phrase. It says, Now they began to sanctify on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, so that's one week, right? They came to the vestibule of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And on the 16th day of the first month, they finished. So let me give you a little context. We're... 2 Chronicles 29 is talking about a man named King Hezekiah, 25 years old at this point uh, in his life. 
And the Bible tells us that King Hezekiah, this young man, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Are you doing what's right in the sight of the Lord? It's significant that he was because his dad was a guy named King Ahaz. And the Bible tells us that Ahaz was increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. The Bible tells us that King Ahaz encouraged moral decline in Judah. I pause because there are people today that are encouraging moral decline in the United States of America and all over the world, really. Uh, but here, this King Ahaz, uh, uh, Scripture reveals that he would sacrifice his own children by burning them in the fire. Think about that. Your own children, burning them in the fire, sacrificing to false gods. We've kind of fixed that problem in our society haven't we? We just kill them while they're still in the womb. So uh, when King Ahaz died, his son, Hezekiah, a godly man, ungodly father, interesting family dynamics there. King Ahaz, or I'm sorry, King Hezekiah had a big mess to clean up. The whole nation, right? Immorality. Immorality all over the place. And uh, King Hezekiah had this big mess to clean up. And so when you get to Second Chronicles 29, you see one of the first things that he did was repair the doors to the house of the Lord. One of the first things he did to influence the nation was open up the church. Going to fix the doors so people can go in. Here's number four. Make church a priority. Make church a priority. Second uh, Chronicles 29.10, it says, It is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that is fierce wrath may turn away from us. And this phrase, it is in my heart, could also be translated, I am fully resolved. On New Year's Day, I'm making a resolution. Here it is. Resolution, New Year's resolution in your Bibles. King Hezekiah, he made a resolution. I'm going to lose weight this year. I'm going to get a gym membership this year. I'm going to stop procrastinating. No, I am going to enter into a covenant with the Lord. I'm going to open up the doors to the church. I'm going to lead my people back into a relationship with the Lord by making church a priority. I'm going to make it easy for people to go to church, the king says. Let's fix the doors. Let's get back to worshiping together as a family, as a nation. Let's dust off our Bibles. Let's commit to a church. Let's restore worship in our lives. This is what Hezekiah is doing. This is what he is saying and so perhaps this year number four is to make this deeper commitment to the house of the lord what does that look like well maybe this would be the year that you would join a 242 life group this is our home group ministry where you can meet throughout the week in somebody's home or you can even open up your home and host a group and and have a group of people come we have people in this room that i know your life has been so enriched by being part of these groups And that's a great way to make a deeper commitment to the house of the Lord. Maybe you want to start coming on Wednesday night. We have a Wednesday night church service here where uh, we call it Wednesday night church. Creative, I know. Uh, But this Wednesday, as the first Wednesday of the month, we're going to devote time to prayer. We're going to seek the Lord and pray. Just pray. You can come and pray about whatever's on your heart, whatever you want to pray about. But we're going to gather together as a family. We're going to lift up our church lift up our nation, lift up one another, uh, sing to the Lord, and just worship him. So I encourage you to, to, uh, to consider doing that this Wednesday. We get together at 6.30. And so this might be a commitment that you need to make as well as just making church more of a priority in your life. Maybe you've, you're a once a monther. Once a monther. Maybe you need to become a two or three times a monther. Um, I don't know. May the Lord... Uh, work that out in your life, but one of the best ways to give God a priority in your life is to give his people a priority in your life. Charles Colson said this, biblically, the church is an organism, not an organization. It is a movement, not a monument. It is not part of the community. It is a whole new community. It is not an orderly gathering. It is a new order with new values, often in sharp conflict with the values of the surrounding society. I like what Franklin Clark Fry said. A person who says he believes in God but never goes to church is like one who says he believes in education but never goes to school. Do you believe in God? You should believe in the church then. 
I uh, was once lived in a city that had a big church in the town, and their little tagline was uh, a church for people that don't like church. And I've often thought about that. I, I understand what you're trying to say there, but God likes church. <laughs> you know, he's, it's his church. He built the church. He loves the church. All right, so that's four. Uh, number five is found in the book of Ezra. In the book of Ezra. Ezra might be a little harder to find if you're trying to track with us. Um, Ezra is um, uh, before Nehemiah, before Job. So if you get to Psalms, you've gone a little bit too far, but we'll put it up on the screen. Ezra chapter 7, this is the fifth occurrence of this phrase. On the first day of the first month, he, speaking of Ezra, began his journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. Or I'm sorry, from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, so it took him four months, right? Uh, according to the good hand, on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So what's going on here? Uh, Ezra was part of the, the community there in Babylon as, the, as God's people had, had to leave Jerusalem. But after 70 years or so, the, they started going back to Jerusalem. And so some had gone back. And here Ezra's a leader. He's a teacher. We read there in, in this uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, he's a teacher, he's a scribe, he's a priest. And uh, I'm sure he probably had a, a pretty decent ministry going on there in Babylon. Uh, but he picked New Year's Day to leave Babylon and begin a new ministry, a journey all the way to Jerusalem. It was a time of change for him. Uh, God was calling him into a new adventure, a new journey. And so maybe this year, 2023, for you is a time for you to begin a new journey of serving God. And so my application here is get involved in serving, excuse me, get involved in serving God. Maybe God is calling you to, to change how you are serving Him. And uh, I am talking about serving Him here at Calvary Chapel, but maybe, I mean, there's certainly other ways and other places to serve Him, obviously. Uh, but, you know, with change often comes a new passion, new ideas when there's a change, maybe a stronger commitment when there are changes. So, so sometimes as we're serving the Lord, your service to God can, can become a, a little stale, uh, but don't stop serving. Maybe, maybe you need to change things up a little bit. Maybe you need to try a new ministry. Maybe you need to move from a greeter to teaching children in the children's ministry. Oh, pastor, no, 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 no. Well, Maybe God's calling you to, to step out in, in faith a little bit. And maybe you should pray about it. Maybe you should talk to one of the leaders here at Calvary Chapel. Maybe it's time to, to open up your home and host a group. Or, or maybe it's time to step up and, and facilitate a group. I don't know. Maybe it's time to go on a missions trip. I don't know. Uh, but maybe 2023 for you, what God's moving in your heart and in your life is to get involved in serving God, a healthy Christian is one who serves. And there's so many different ways to do that here at Calvary Chapel and, of course, uh, in other ministry ventures as well. We have an entire online ministry where you can just sit at home and do things online. So uh, that being said, let's look at the sixth occurrence of this phrase, which also occurs in the book of Ezra in chapter 10. It says, By the first day of the first month, they finished questioning... All the men who had taken pagan wives. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, don't have to say too much about, okay, no, I'm just kidding. All right, so what's going on here? So we have to put the passage into context. So when Ezra came back to Jerusalem, he led a group of exiles back there from Babylon. When he got there, he discovered that some of the people, including some of the leaders, had married pagan wives. Now, that word pagan, I don't know what kind of ring that has in your heart or in your mind, uh, but it, it might be more helpful to think of this in our vernacular, in our, in our culture, to say that they married people who were not Christians. Okay, so you have to think of a, a 21st century culture of Christianity here in the church. Uh, this would be like going and marrying somebody with completely different values than you, completely unbiblical values. It's not talking about interracial marriages. There's nothing wrong at all with interracial 
marriages. My wife is Hispanic and I'm not, and we have lots of fun stories to tell uh, about that. But this is talking about what the New Testament would say being unequally yoked. When you marry somebody, uh, you get yoked with them. And that is no yoke. Thank you. Thank you very much. But your lives are intertwined together. And, and the worst mistake you could make, other than never accepting Jesus as your Savior, is to yoke yourself and, and, and unite yourself with somebody with values radically different, different than yours. And, and, uh, and so this is what's going on here when Ezra gets there. Uh, now I want you to, to notice here in, in chapter 9 of Ezra, and Ezra chapter 9, I'll encourage you to, to read it um, when you go home, but it's a beautiful prayer. You see, Ezra saw this sin that was going on in his community, and he fasted, and he prayed. Uh, fasting is going without food to deny yourself something so that you can spend that time seeking the Lord. And then it says he tore his garments. We don't do that in our culture, but it's just a sign of, 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 of repentance, of remorse, of, of humility. You see, he looked around at his culture, at his nation, at his people, and he saw tragedy. He saw all of these lives in disarray, and, and he, he did not know what to do. Part of his prayer, I'll read verse 6 of Ezra 9. It says, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. What strikes me about this is that even though he wasn't guilty, because this wasn't his sin, it was his nation's sin. His heart was broken. His heart was broken with somebody else's sin. A good prayer for us is, God, break my heart with that which breaks your heart. I don't want my heart to be shaped by our culture. I want my heart to be shaped by you, God. And this is, this is what's happening in Ezra's life. He's weeping, and he's praying, and he's grieved at what's happening with other people, these people that had made these terrible choices. Now, there's a difficult verse here that, uh, and I, I never want to skip over something just because it's difficult, uh, but it seems that the solution that they came up with was divorce. Uh, look at Ezra chapter 10, verse 3. It says, Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Now, it's interesting, the, the, the word there put away is, is not typically the same Hebrew word that's used for divorce, but it does seem like divorce is what's happening here. And then it says at the end of that verse, let it be done according to the law. So uh, it's never easy to talk about divorce. Uh, and this passage certainly leaves us with more questions than answers, I believe. Uh, we're not exactly sure what actually happened. What about the children that are mentioned in that verse? It's important that when we come across passages like this, that we never let a difficult passage interpret a clear passage. Uh, in other words, when we come to an issue like divorce, we should not build a doctrine about divorce on the difficult passages. Do you understand what I mean? We should look at the clear passages, build our doctrine there, and then try to interpret the difficult passages in light of the clear passages. So if we were to do that, and I'm not going to do a comprehensive study, Bible study on divorce, but I just want to uh, set the context here a little bit better so that when I get to the application, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, so the Bible clearly says that God hates divorce. That's in the book of Malachi. God hates divorce. So we know divorce is not good. Uh, in an ideal situation, it's not God's plan. It's not God's desire. Uh, we do know that the Old Testament does give allowance for divorce, and it says that according to uh, certain criteria, divorce is allowed. It's permitted. Uh, Jesus mentions uh, that one of the allowances for divorce is adultery. So an adultery breaks that marriage covenant. And Jesus uh, says that that is uh, a reason for divorce. It doesn't make divorce mandatory. 
but it does make it as a biblical option. Uh, Paul as well tells us in 1 Corinthians 7 that if you're married to an unbeliever, so somebody who would be unequally yoked, a Christian married to a non-Christian, doesn't matter, wife, husband, either way, uh, that if you are married to an unbeliever, Paul's counsel is try to stay married to him, but if they leave, don't try to keep them. Let, let them leave. That that would be another allowance uh, for divorce. And in our culture, it's so complicated, isn't it? There, there are so many situations, so many different you know, complications in this topic that I always advise people to seek the advice and counsel of a pastor and maybe a marriage, uh, marriage professional, marriage counselor as it relates to to uh, this topic. Let me also say this. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit that just dropped this into my mind. Uh, There is a teaching out there by some prominent Christians, um, Christian teachers, that uh, that once you get divorced, you should and could never get married biblically. I don't believe that's biblical. I believe that that if you do get divorced, I believe that God can restore. Uh, Even I've known people that have gotten divorced uh, before they were Christian, they got saved and they remarried the same two people and they're still married to this day as far as I know and then I've known people that they've as Christians they've gotten divorced and, uh, and, and, and then the Lord has worked things out and they've you know, married other people or whatever it might be so, so each case is unique, each case is different I know that this topic touches a lot of different lives on all kinds of different levels and so I would just encourage you uh, you know, before you make any of these major decisions, seek some professional counsel and, uh, and, and talk about it with people that you trust and that you love. Search the scriptures. Lots of prayer. The application I want to make, though, here is this. Deal with sin. Deal with sin. I'm really struck the fact that Ezra was dealing with someone else's sin. So when you say deal with sin, of course that means your own sin. Right? If there's something going on in your life and you've got some kind of hidden habit uh, that you know is not pleasing to the Lord, bring it out to the light. You know, uh, share with a, a pastor or, or a, a, a trusted friend, uh, whoever it might be. Um, you just simply can't ignore your sin. The prescription the Bible gives is repentance, you know, confession and repentance and restoration. Uh, but don't let it slide. You bring it to the light, you confess it. What would your life look like? If you got rid of that pesky sin, if you said goodbye to whatever it is that you're struggling with. But then this also has to do with dealing with other people's sin. Maybe God might call you to, to uh, go to a brother or sister that you know there's something wrong in their life. And with all humility, obviously, you know, taking that plank out of your eye so that you can go with all humility and say, brother, sister, I've got a concern. Can I talk to you? Can I share this with you? Can we pray about this together? And God might use you to turn someone back to him. Okay, uh, two more. Uh, Number seven, the seventh time this occurs uh, here in the Bible is found in the book of Ezekiel. So we get into the prophets. Uh, Ezekiel is one of the major prophets. Right after the book of Isaiah, you have Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 29, it says, Verse 17, Ezekiel 29, 17, it came to pass in the 27th year in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and then we're not going to look at everything that the Lord uh, told Ezekiel, but I want you to understand Ezekiel was a prophet. uh, So he had this role from the Lord that his job was to hear from God and then take this message and communicate it to God's people. Uh, And obviously, he wrote it down. Ezekiel heard from the Lord. He wrote it down. And then he, God used that to communicate to the people. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, as we think about hearing from the Lord, it says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time passed to the fathers, talking about the fathers of the faith, by the prophets, Ezekiel being one of the prophets, So this is how God would speak to people through these prophets. But in these last days, which we're living in now, he has spoken to us by his son. He's spoken to us through Jesus. This is the culmination of God's message to mankind is Jesus. And so God speaks to us primarily today through the word of God. Those that walked and talked with Jesus have written for us uh, the teachings of Jesus. 
Um, and so, if you're encouraged by the Lord, uh, His Word speaking to you, um, we live in this day and age where there's so many books, so many sermons, so many articles, so many videos, so many podcasts, all, all, and many of them good. But I believe all of these things can just squelch out the voice of the Lord. Create so much noise, so much maybe even confusion in our lives. But the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. Why? Because he was listening. Because he was listening. And I mentioned he wrote it down. Uh, here's the application I believe the Lord would have for us. Number seven, slow down. Slow down. Let's all say that together. Slow down. No, nope, you said it too fast. Slow down. Take a breath. Push the pause button and just listen. Way too much stimulation in our lives. Way too much stimulation. Journal. I want to encourage you to journal. Uh, get a, a blank book. You may say, Pastor, I don't write. Listen not asking you to become a novelist. Just write down what God's telling you. Write down what, maybe it's even just writing a verse, word for word. I read this quote this week, and it's an anonymous quote. I don't know who wrote it, uh, but I think it's extremely profound. If you don't journal, you're missing out on your own wisdom given by God. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we are uh, hopefully soon going to be um, in our Agape coffee shop putting in a small, like a mini little bookstore there where you can go and, you know, buy some books. And we're going to buy a bunch of blank journals. So you could just grab some journal, grab a journal, buy one for yourself, one for your friend, whatever it might be, and, ju and just begin to journal. Uh, this is a way, and, and this, for me, out of all these eight points, this is the one that I think I really need to apply in my life, is that I need to slow down. My mind, my wife will tell you, my mind is constantly racing. I'm constantly thinking about things. Over the last few days, I've been thinking about colors for a logo that people are asking me, what color should we do this logo? And there's, they've sent me literally like 40 different options. And I'm like, no, I like this. No, I like this. No, how about this one? No, how about this one? And, and just like laying in bed thinking like, oh, what color should we do? <laughs> I'm like, stop, Pat. Just slow down. Listen to the Lord. I want to encourage you to journal. Uh, write down a verse that speaks to you. Write down one or two things that you're learning. Uh, and then later on when you're struggling, you can go back and read what you wrote. And oftentimes God will, will speak to you. You can write down your prayer requests. And when God answers your prayers, you can go back and see how he answers you. And I, this happened to me because I've journaled for years and years and years. And I go back and I read like some of the different prayer requests I've had from years and years ago. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm s my life is so much better <laughs> than if, I, if God would have done what I wanted him to do. My life is way better now than what I thought I wanted. And it's just, it's just amazing. So journaling just helps you so much just helps you to slow down and listen to the Lord. And then lastly, uh, also in Ezekiel, we see in chapter 45 of Ezekiel, it says, thus says the Lord God, in the first month, on the first day of the month, on New Year's Day, take a young bull without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. Sanctuary. And so here you have an a animal sacrifice for cleansing the sanctuary. Uh, so when you leave today, we're going to have bulls available out in the lobby. New Year's Day, sacrifice, take it home, sacrifice the bull, then throw it on the grill and have some carne asada. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Carne asada was last night. All right, um, so for every picture in the Old Testament, uh, there's a principle in the New Testament. And all of these animal sacrifices you see in the Old Testament, many of them point us to where? Jesus Christ. Because the animals are sacrificed for the forgiveness of sin, when Jesus shows up on the scene, he is the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. And so the application is simply this. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. When you think about a new year, if you set this in the crosshairs, this is my life. This is my year. I want my year. I want people to see more of Jesus in me this year than they ever have in all my past years combined. I want Jesus to be the focus of my thoughts, of my actions, of my goals, of my conversation, of everything that I do. I want it to all be about Jesus. I, there's no better New Year's resolution than making your life all about Jesus, the greatest sacrifice 
the greatest joy, the greatest message you could ever preach is that of Jesus. 